Welcome to the West London Sport Keep Your Podcast on the back of yet another defeat for a struggling injury ravaged Rangers side. This time at the hands of lowly Rotherham United. Um, Jordan Hugel added his name to a list of ex QPR players to turn it on against their former team with two goals as the Millers won 3 1. It's a 50 feet in a row for Gareth Ainsworth's side, who last week learned the hacker in a bid to try and discover that in the New Zealand all black winning spirit. However, instead of performing like a team of Dan Carters, it was more like June Carter that turned up at the New York Stadium as the Millers leapfrog Rangers on the championship table. The result leaves Rangers nervously looking over their shoulders towards the relegation zone. Something none of us thought, none of us would have predicted when this team was sitting top of the table only five months ago. Uh, now, a lot's happened in that time, but winning isn't one of them, with the team now registering just one victory in 20 games. And with a crippling injury list to boot, the next few weeks are going to be crucial um, if this team is to avoid the unthinkable prospect of League One football next season. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by the man who scored 136 times in a Rangers shirt, former Rangers striker Kevin Gallant. Uh, now, for many years, the London football reporting industry has been dominated by West Ham in Fleet Street, but the same is often said about QPR fans in the music industry. So it's my pleasure this week to welcome one of those QPR types, music journalist and broadcaster Paul Stokes, who was actually there in person at Rotherham on Saturday. Hello. Right. Um, so firstly, Kev, uh, Rotherham game, are we at a crisis point now? And uh, do you think this slump can be arrested? Yeah, I think yeah we are a bit yeah we are in crisis and and the reasons well the main reasons why is pretty much obvious because we can't seem to win a game can't seem to keep a clean sheet and we've got a massive uh, injury list which none of us know well you might know or when are the uh, some of these players going to be available to come back and help the the team on a Saturday or a Tuesday. So we are a little bit in crisis because of the form. The one win in 20 at any football club, that's crisis mode. Uh, do I think we get relegated? Last week I would was thinking no. But as, as the games come thick and fast and we're not picking up any points, then I'm thinking there's a little bit of a possibility it's just a case of whether the teams below us can string some wins together. And uh, we still got, are we a seven point cushion or is it eight point cushion? I think it's eight. Eight point cushion with how many games to go? 11, 12? I don't know. So I think we need two or three wins, two wins. But at the moment, I can't see where a win is coming from um, with the performances that we're putting in at the moment. Okay. Now, Paul, you were, as I said, mentioned before, you were at the game on Saturday. Um, speaking to you yesterday, you felt the perhaps the scoreline was a little bit uh, didn't really reflect the uh, the manner of the performance. Yeah, I mean, it didn't feel like a three-one drubbing in the way that we played. I mean, we spent a lot of the, the opening exchanges of the game in Rotherham's half, and and in the second half, it was quite a competitive half. What what I think the problem. On, on Saturday was, A, there was no cutting edge at all up front. So there, it was like, it was hard to see where a goal was coming from. And obviously the, the, the consolation goal we got was from the penalty spot. But more problematically is I don't think Rotherham worked particularly hard for the three goals they did score. I mean, and beyond that, I think Seni Dieng made one save just before half time. But the three goals they scored were kind of, you know, could have been prevented with, with sort of just some sensible defending rather than, you know, Rotherham, you know, came out and outplayed Rangers. So I think on one level, it was obviously really disappointing to lose, but at least the performance wasn't, I don't think, totally doom and gloom, which gives me some hope for possibly not Watford on Saturday, but the game's beyond that. Yeah, it, it does kind of seem that every time a team attacks, they score, which is obviously never good. Um but, I mean, it's just a lack of options in defence, really. Um, I mean, you, you've got, you know, Aaron Drew making his debut, fair play to him. You know, Osman Kagai played that position, you know, when he's, you know, very much a backup to Ethan Laird. And then you've got, you know, Jimmy Dunn and Rob Dickey. And Rob Dickey is having a horrendous time at the moment. He looks a long way short of the player that, um, you know, looks so impressive for kind of, you know, much of his QPR career. I mean, Kevin, you, you hear about, it's always strikers that get accused of losing confidence and losing it. But I mean, it's very kind of unusual for a defender just to kind of fall off a cliff in the manner that the, the Dickie has. Yeah, it is a strange one. And he has really, I mean, well, obviously the team has fallen off the cliff over the last few months, but 
certain individual players have fallen off, and Dicky is definitely one of them. In you know, he was a reliable centre off for QPR at the, especially last season. And I think we were having debates um, at the start of the season, and I think you were quite vocal on it in uh, about that he should be playing every week when he was available. But now you feel like he needs to be taken out and sort of um, and rested and maybe recharged. But because, but we have got no one to replace him. But he really is. I mean, I wasn't at the game on Saturday, but I saw the goals and, you know, the first goal, he was all over the place and then he gives away a penalty for the second. He's just, he's, he's having a, a real tough time. And and we spoke about this and I spoke about this before, but, and I know we haven't got the, the men or the players available because of injuries, but it does seem to me that Dickie's more suited to a three at the back mm. where... This was what we played last season, and and Mark Warburton started this when he is tenure as manager. He always played a flat back four, and then I think we called for it on this podcast week in week out, and he went for a, for a three at the back, um, which suited um, Barbe at the time, left side centre half, and suited Rob Dickey as well. So we haven't got the players available, but I think definitely Dickey is suited and plays a lot better at a three at the back. Yeah, because although I mean the team fell away in the second half of last year, they weren't conceding goals like they are now. They were losing games one nil, two one, that kind of thing. I mean, did Paul, as I say, on Saturday when they went one nil down, did sort of heads go down? Did it look like that? You know, there was a resignation about you know well, we're behind, we're going to lose, or was there any kind of positives you saw from you know the response to going behind? No, I didn't think it was. Like, I mean, obviously, it was incredibly disappointing. And, you know, particularly, you know, two games into a new manager's tenure, you're thinking, come on, you know, it, it, it was such a... I mean, it was a great finish by Hugel, but it was, you know, he was unmarked, effectively, just in front of the box so he could pick his spot. And as good as the cross was from their number 11, there was that moment of, like, how is he... How is there one player from the opposition in our box not being marked? That that just, just seemed strange. But I think there wasn't, amongst the rest of the team, because we've been playing OK to that point, there wasn't a sense of, like... Oh, they've outplayed us there. I think there was a sense of okay, we can get back into this. And even when we went 2 0 down, which was obviously a, a kind of very clumsy penalty, we conceded. We pushed, they kept pushing. And when um, Richards came on, he actually thought he looked really good. And he was, we suddenly had a player when he came on where we had like five, 10 minutes where suddenly we had a player who could run at Rotherham and, and get through them and, you know, put, give, give, put them under pressure. I think up to that point, we, we had a very sort of a good sort of passing team, but we just didn't have that player. You know, like Chair would have done normally if he hadn't been injured, of someone who could, you know, really make Rob and think about, oh, if we commit too much, this player's going to be able to come through us. He had a great run, which I think was in the build up to the penalty that we were awarded. And it was just that moment when we scored the penalty, there was a real sense, oh, that maybe this is turning. Maybe it's going to be like the Reading game where we do pull it back to two all. And then, the, you know, the, the giveaway possession on the edge of our area when everyone started to push up the pitch thinking, oh, we're going to do this. I mean, Rob and then get the third and the game's over. It, it was it was a really interesting. It was as I say, it's, a, it's a, what's third three one on the bounce. I think, or it's definitely the second. And you look at that and go, that seems like a team that are just giving up. But, but that wasn't really the sense I got throughout the game. That, you know, at least the attitude of, of of the players, obviously a very threadbare squad, seemed to be like, no, let's keep going. Let's let let's put the effort in. So that gives me some hope for the future games. Okay. Now with Gareth Ainsworth have been in charge. Now you'd expect the kind of the, the guts and effort that he, you know showed when he was a player and I mean this week we had vision of the QPR squad taking part in or well, learning the hacker so yeah. Kev I know you know during your long career you must have had numerous kind of team building experiments and things from various managers any that stick out in your memory of being particularly uh, well, the <laughs> um we did that but we weren't in a struggling position. But Ian Holloway took us to the London Ballet once. But we weren't struggling at the time. I think it was more of a PR stunt for the club. But I do remember, I think Tim Brake had got us all in a minibus and drove us down there. We didn't know where we were going. They didn't say anything, just took us there. We got there and we all went, what's going on here? And we all said, we ain't coming out. So we literally started rocking the bus. And at one stage... <laughs> I thought the bus was going to tip. We were all giving it, we were up singing, we're not coming out. And I think Ol Ian Olway came out and gave us a few Fs. I said, get in here right now. We went in there and I think I stood next to Kenny Jacket. He was assistant manager at the time. 
And I basically just moaned and said, I'm not doing any of this. Why aren't we doing proper training? <laughs> but um, look, doing the hacker, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of these, uh, these sort of stunts um, because I always think you, you, you've got to put the hard work on the training pitch and to try and fix, fix stuff. I can understand why um, Gareth has done it because he, he obviously wants to try something different. But I just, I'm, I'm very, um, I was very skeptical why the club sort of released it and showed it because you now put a rod on your back and everyone's like, I mean, the amount of phone calls I've got, I got and text messages, not from QPR fans, I'm from other clubs fans saying, you know, like laughing and what's going on. And it does make a rod for your back because, and then you go to Rotherham and you, and you lose 3-1. You're like thinking, well, if we had won 3-1, was it because of the hacker? Have we lost 3-1? Is it because of the hacker? No, it's not. It's got nothing to do with it. Win or lose. So I'm not a great fan of these things. Uh, look, at the end of the day, QPR need to get some players back fit. And I know... There's a lot of chat saying that a lot of those players are Mick Beals, ex-players, and they, they might have downed tools a little bit. But we need to get some players back fit. And, and the main thing, and if I was to go into Saturday's game against Watford, and is the, the, the main thing for me is just keep a clean, we can't keep a clean sheet. And Paul, you're at the game, you're saying there wasn't much in, the, in, in the, between the teams. But when you're in such a bad run of form and a team has an, like an attack, and you're thinking they haven't even, and they score, and they haven't even worked hard for that goal that much. And I saw the goal, and it didn't really, I mean, ball down into the channel, cross, and then Hugo's unmarked with acres of space to pick his spot. And you're thinking, and, the, and then the team is thinking, and maybe the crowd, I don't know what you were thinking, but it's like, here we go again. We've been good, we started the game well, they have one attack, and, and we're one nil down. And, and it's a, men, men, a mentality thing then. And it's hard to get out of that mentality where you sort of, Every time they have attacked, they score, and we can't create anything. And there's probably not much between the two teams. And let's be fair, Rob, them ain't great, are they? So that, that is sort of a game when you look at um, on paper, you're like thinking we should be getting something out of this game. Mm. So, yeah. Now, Paul, I know you do a lot of work with record labels and artists about social media messaging and your stuff with the BBC and that. I mean, what did you think of the club's decision to release? The footage and YouTube and Twitter. I mean, it got I mean, picked I up by the Daily Mirror as well. I mean, obviously, any publicity is good publicity, but maybe not this one. Well, I think. I mean, I think the QPR media team do an excellent job. When you look at the sort of the, the stuff they put out, it is they are competing with Premier League clubs in terms of the quality of the stuff they're putting out. So, I've, I've, you know, no criticism over the over their output. I think. The one thing I, I, I advise when I, when I work with labels, particularly artists, is like there is no one size fits all. If you do this on social media, then you will get this. You know, it has to be tailored to, re to reflect the character of the artist you're working with or the label or the organisation. And I think, obviously, the previous three or four managers that team have probably worked with have been possibly, you know, a bit more in the more classic manager mould. And I think this is possibly a learning curve for both the media team where they're going to say, well, Gareth is going to want to do things that are probably a bit different and do we release these straight away or if we're going to film them do we hold on to them and maybe do it a bit later on and obviously it'll be a learning curve for gareth because at wickham i imagine their budgets for media are probably a lot smaller than queen's park rangers and so he's probably not had the experience of going you know yeah you can film it should that go out now when should it go out whereas and obviously he's like a week and a half into a new job that's not going to be his priority going well what what's what's the what's, what's the social comments going to be on a, on a bit of filming that i've done to try and raise the morale amongst the team and I think I mean I think it was a good idea if you look look at the way Mick Bill spoke at the start of the season about how they how he was empowering the group and they were making decisions for themselves all those kind of interviews you've then had him leave and had a manager comes in who from the outside at least seems to be a sort of less charismatic uh more technical manager and I think you know probably Gareth has gone into that and gone I need something to try and rekindle that sort of sense of the group and how do I do that quickly you know bearing in mind as Kev says most of the work has to be done on the training pitch, you know. So, so channeling the All Blacks in a, in a hacker-like thing is possibly behind closed doors a really good thing. And I think if we saw it at the end of the season and gone, oh, you didn't know about this, that might have been a much better way to present it. But I think it will just be the learning curve of, you know, the, the media team getting used to, okay, this is a different kind of manager. We're in that sort of 
cycle of there's a game every Saturday, we have to produce that kind of footage, and then and then there's another game, we, we, we cover that. And so they just need to possibly take that step back and just think about their strategy and just how they get the best out of a character like Gareth, who I think is great for the club to have at this stage, but but present it in a way that you're going to get, you know, it's not going to put him under undue pressure, where, you know, he doesn't need people going, oh, it's all because he, he made them do a silly team building exercise, which I don't think is the case for the results. Either. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess if you're on a winning run of one defeat in 20, then it's all, all well and good, but when you're, you know... I think I think Paul's right there. I think that should, that, that should have been released at the end... I mean, if, if QPR go on to, and we start winning some matches and then release it, and then you said, this is what we were doing behind the scenes. I think I think that would have been better. I just want to go back because a, a reminder, I mean, you probably seen years ago when Jerry Francis was manager, we were on the old house party on that gotcha. <laughs> now that was a funny stunt. And I remember the day, I think it was a Tuesday, and I remember Jerry coming up to me and a couple of the other younger lads and said to us, what are you doing this afternoon, boys? We said... Uh, I just said, like usual, just going to go home and chill out. He went, "No, you're not. Get yourselves down to the mate, get yourselves down to the stadium. We've got a, um, a QPR. What was it? New kit launch." And we was like, "Oh, okay." And then, you know, I think it's on YouTube still. It's actually quite quite funny. Um, it, well, it was hilarious to be honest. Yeah, but that was another stunt that um, QPR. My vague memories of that is a luminous kind of oh um, the, the shell suit. It, no, worse than that. It was like I think I think Les had, was no Trevor Sinclair was wearing a tutu or something at some stage. With <laughs> it's on YouTube. Whoever's watching this wants to watch it. You'll have a right good laugh. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, but I mean, it, it, you know, I, I listened to a, a, pod, a podcast a few weeks ago. Um, Danny Simpson, formerly of QPR, describing his time at Leicester and when they won the league and the team spirit was, I think you described them as the kind of the best, the world's best pub team. You know, they had a real kind of close togetherness and, you know, a lot of it was going to the pub and going out together and stuff like that. I mean, that's become less and less a thing in, in, um, you know, in modern day football, you know, with the healthy lifestyles, etc. But I mean, do you think Kev, a, a club like QBR because of where it is in London, it's more difficult to have players living together, whereas if you're in a Leicester or a, I don't know, a Stoke or something like that, everyone lives, yeah. you know, you know quite close together so you can get out and do stuff together. Whereas, whereas you've got lads that live in Chiswick and some that live in Beaconsfield or some that live in Wind. Do you know what I mean? There's no sort of... Yeah, and everyone likes different things, but w when I was, when we got promoted that time, we, we sort of had quite, we weren't out every week, but we'd organise stuff. I mean, I used to be in charge of which I didn't really like, but in charge in charge of finding people, which ain't a great thing to be in charge of because when you're demanding money off people all the time for being late, it was pretty much Paul Furlong every every day. He would come <laughs> late. Like, Paul Furlong would uh, Paul Furlong would stop at the shop, buy a Lucas Aid and a Nutrigrain bar every day, and come in late three minutes every day. And I'm like, birds, you're killing me. You owe me another twenty quid. So basically, Paul Furlong played for all our nights out. <laughs> <laughs> what we did, I got the money, and then I would say, guys, back to team building. I would say, right, we've got this amount of money. We haven't got a game, say, for maybe, I don't know, 10 days. We're going to go out. We'll either go bowling or whatever. We'll, we'll meet here. We'll meet here. We'll go for a meal and then whatever, drink or whatever. And, and, and usually, we, we sort of... After that, we sort of always, if we were struggling, we'd always get sort of a, a result after that. You can't do it like it's a bit different now with like, you know, healthy lifestyle. I mean, we weren't unhealthy. We train hard and you go out for a few drinks. But I don't think that's a, pro a problem like for, for it lads. One night out ain't going to kill you. Do you know what I mean? But look, everyone's different and they might not want to do that. So you have to get together and sort of organising and sort of, and everyone suggests what we should do. Should we go bowling? Should we go, I don't know. We're just bowling, really. Yeah. <laughs> just bowling and go to the pub. Or, yeah. You know, I think you said it in the text message every day to me, and go to a pub, close it down, put some money behind it. I have a pool table, I have a pool competition, I have a table tennis competition. And, you know, especially if, 
is quite a good idea of just getting everyone together and having a laugh. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they might well be doing that. We, we don't know. But, um, I mean, well, they you did for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you, I mean, obviously, you, you played in, a, in, a, in an era where there was a lot of message boards and stuff like that. There wasn't, like, the Twitter and the kind of the discourse that players get. Now, if you're in a pub, someone with a camera taking a picture, that kind of thing. Is it... I mean, perhaps is that is it more difficult now for players to kind of do what you used to do as players? Yeah. I mean, could you imagine if they did go into a pub and then the fans come in and then they're taking pictures and you've got one win in 20, it don't mm. look good. And then the next game you lose, it would be like the fans, do you know what I mean? The perception of it would be horrendous. So it is difficult, yeah, with with social media and every, every that's a camera, isn't it? Your phone's mm. a camera and everyone's just clicking. So a little bit difficult. That's why you've got to, you know, just maybe hire a place out where it's not as if they're not uh, lads who ain't got a few quid. They can't hire out a place and, and keep it private. Yeah. So obviously, Stefan Johansson's the, 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 the captain at the moment. You know, very, very good player, very, very experienced player. Um, a lot of when a team's in a struggling like it is now, a lot of kind of owners who's put on the captain. What are you doing to lift spirits on that? I mean, you were captain of QBR. What, what, I mean, obviously it was your club, so it's a very, I guess, different than it's for Johansson. But did you find people looking to you when perhaps, you know, results? I mean, that, that yeah. season when you got to the playoff final, I think it was a run of results where it wasn't great sort of before Christmas and the, the yeah. crowd were getting a bit restless. I mean, did, did you kind of feel the need to step up and sort of have words? Well, no, you don't step up. You, 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 Stephanie Hansen's got, he seems quite quiet. He might not be quiet. He seems, I'm just looking from the outside, he seems quite quiet and a nice bloke, but you've got to lead by example on the pitch and do your talking on the pitch. And I'm not saying he's not, but he's coming back from in. He's been out injured. I don't think he's 100% like fit. Like when you get that rhythm of games and you're like, and then you just, you're playing non stop. He's been out for a while, but he's got to step up. All the senior players have got to st step up. Like every player's got to step up, but you've got to look to your older players, your senior players, sort of get the games by the scruff of the neck and lead by example on the pitch. Mm. And time's running out. We're yeah. now into March. Two months left. Really? Got to get some, got, got to get two or three wins. And quickly. Yeah. To stop I mean the rock. Because the longer it goes on, the harder it is to get that win. Yeah. I think, I mean, you you know, Gareth's hands are tied a little bit. You know, there's, with the, there are so many players out. And I think it's got a stage now where some of these guys, you've got to chuck the sports science out the window and just say, mate, you need to play. Um, yeah, I mean... It's, I mean, I was, I was surprised he didn't start Richards on, on Saturday. Just the way he talked about him on Friday in his press conference and... You know, when you haven't got chair and you haven't got a Willock, he is that player that that kind of he, a he needs to play and b he is sort of he's been signed as that successor to chair and Willock. If you're going to play him, play him. I mean, starting Albert Adoma, you know, bless Albert, he's he's done well for QBR, but he's he's you know his better days are behind him, and he is a perhaps a player to throw in off the bench rather than start. And you know, um, you know, or maybe Richards bring him on, give him bring him on at half time. I was surprised. I was surprised he didn't start personally but you know they need to get some of these players back now and you know um i, I, I felt as well i don't know what you guys think i'll come to you first paul i think they miss dykes he doesn't score the goals he perhaps should but i think the, the team looks better when he's in it than it has done in, in, you know in in the last few weeks yeah i mean i think they miss his sort of you know he does keep running doesn't he and he is a good player you know, he covers defensively, you know, for set pieces and things like that. He does cover a lot of the pitch. I mean, Chris Martin, to be fair, I think is is a does something that Dykes hasn't done as much of, which he, if the ball is piloted long, he will bring it down and bring people into play. The trouble is, if he's been there at the start of the season and he's bringing Willock and Chair into play, then you're going, oh, okay, this is exciting, we can move it forward. Whereas at the moment, until Richards came on Saturday, I don't think we had that player who, who is picking up the ball and running. So, I mean, you know, Dykes would be obviously having 
Dykes back would be a, would be a big boost for the club. I wonder as well, will he, will, would will Gareth consider playing him with two up, two up front? I mean, you think how much better Dykes was when he played alongside Austin in the second half of that season when when he came in on loan. That actually maybe signing Martin might be an inadvertent sort of bonus if there's a way of getting both of them in the team together and giving Dykes that two striker option that he seems to play better with as well. Mm. Kev, do you think if he does that, there's almost he's falling into the trap of worrying about well, people say I think I'm a long ball manager. I'm not. Um, to go too big man up front, do you think? I mean, look, I think anything, anything's out the window now, as in anything to get a result. Do you, do you understand? It doesn't matter if we go long, but we win. I don't care. It's got to win some matches. Now, regarding Chris Martin, I think he's a good player, but Chris Martin hasn't got the legs and he never had the legs. But if you've got players around him who will run that way, and he can get hold of it and he can play people in. That's what he's really good at. So regarding him playing, if Dyke, I mean, does anyone know when Dykes is available? No. No? So obviously he's had a very bad illness, but I can see that when Dykes is fit, that they'll play two up front. I, I, would, I would probably much say that will definitely happen. And if you have to go a bit longer, who cares? Just mm. stay up. That doesn't matter. I mean, you don't... It's like Charlie Austin is not there anymore. But Charlie Austin, if you put crosses in the box, Charlie Austin scores. But if you're not going to put Charlie boxes in the uh, crosses in the box, there's no point playing Charlie Austin because he ain't going to run in behind. Where to be fair, Dykes actually can run in behind. Chris Martin can come to feet, get the ball in the box a little bit earlier. Yeah, it's not the worst thing. Hmm. Yeah. So um. So Watford doesn't really get any easier. Um. Although they are aside Watford, I mean they had a by all accounts a pretty lame nil nil draw with Preston at home on Saturday. Uh, QBR have beaten already this season, but I think if you look at the starting eleven from that day um, to the one that started on Saturday, I think there was eight different players playing on that day. Um, you know, if maybe two or three of those could be back for Saturday. You, you know, a Power or or a, or a Laird um, or even a Willock. You know that might give Rangers some sort of chance, but it's going to be it's going to be difficult, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, it's a tough game because Watford actually Watford are, I think are un, like QPR. I think Watford have under are underachieved this season. QPR are definitely underachieving at the moment. Uh, but need we look back? You need your fullbacks back quick. Need them back quick. It's going to be a tough game, sort of localish, localish derby sort of um, type game, but. They're very up and down, aren't they? On their day, they could beat anyone, Watford. And like you said, they drew nil-nil with Preston. I mean, it's not a great result. If you're looking to get into the playoffs, you, you'd expect Watford with the players they've got, the budget they've got, that they should be beating teams like uh, Preston. And they'll probably be thinking that we should be going to QPR on the way QPR playing on the run-off form. That, that's a, a good chance of getting three points. But, you know, we got to stop the rot as quickly as possible. And it's got to start happening and... The main objective, they should be working their socks off on the training ground defensively to get a, um, a clean sheet and, and start from that base of getting some clean sheets and then working, uh, sort that out. All the good managers always talk about sort out your defence and then you and then we'll work out going forward. So that's the main thing for me is to, be able to, try, to get a clean sheet on Saturday. Okay. And a, and a prediction? <sighs> Oh, you're me killing me here. Um, I'll let Paul go first on this one. No, no. Uh, do you know what? The way it's going, and I'm, I always, I never say, I don't like calling QPR to lose. I'm going to go 1-1. One, one. I'm being uh, optimistic. Okay. Paul, did you see anything on Saturday that might give you reason to be mildly optimistic? <laughs> reason to be cheerful. Um I mean, it really does depend on if, if we put the side out on if we play on on against Rotherham against Watford. I, I, it's going to be tough, very tough, because you know as as well as people like Kakai and Drew did, you know, filling in at short notice, you're not having a left sided player, and then having lost Cherry plays in that who played in that left channel before, and that is just a, a really big weakness that was quite obvious, like the area that Rotherham could exploit, and obviously a team like Watford. Have the players who could really um, 
exploit that that kind of uh, poten potential uh, way route to goal. So I, I mean, if it, it really depends. If, if everyone is training and we can get some players back, and maybe you know people didn't travel who actually will be able to play, then you know if we can get a left-sided player on, on, on at left back, then may uh, you know I'd, I'd be optimistic that maybe a bit of luck and you, you might nick something home crowd and and, and pray and pray that Watford are sort of inconsistent as they have been at other games. But yeah, it's going to be. I mean, to me, it almost feels like this. This all the crap. You know, we ought to treat this as a free hit. If you get something from this, or you don't get beat too badly, that's almost a good result. And then let's prioritise uh, Blackpool away and uh, and Birmingham teams like you know that to get the two wins. So I mean, maybe there'll be a lack of pressure perhaps on on, on Saturday amongst the score because it no one's expecting anyone anything from this. I don't think. Okay. And what are you expecting score wise? I'll be optimistic as well and say nil nil. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Clean sheet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it is going to be tough. I mean, I look at it and think they're a funny side, Watford, because they, they they kind of remind me a little bit of the QPR side that came down in 2016. There's a lot of talent there and underachieving, a lot of big egos there um, that should be doing a lot better than what they are. Um, I mean, really, I think the QPR is a start, isn't it? I mean, if they go down early, then it's going to be very difficult to get something out of it. But you know, if the crowd get up and you know if they, they, they need some bodies back, they do. They need they need the two full backs back. They need Tyler Roberts. We keep getting told he's near playing. He has to be sort of you know you're on loan earning good money. He's got to be kind of back in the frame. You'd think um, it's going to be really hard. I can't see Rangers getting anything out of here, so I'm going to be really really pessimistic and go two one Watford. Um, yeah, hope I'm wrong, but it's yeah. I mean, I think almost now you've got to look at the Blackpool game next week and think that's try and get as many as we can back for that and sort of target that as a. I think I think Paul Wright when he says predicting this game when we don't know who's available, it's, it's a tough one. Mm. I, I'm 100% behind you there, Paul. If it's the if it's the team that played on Saturday, we're going to struggle, <laughs> but we need some players back quickly. And then you get the players back. You get a win and, you know, optimism is back. Mm. Yeah, because I thought, I, thought I thought the crowd were pretty good against um, um, Blackburn last week. I thought it was good good noise here. It has felt a lot better than it has, you know, in, in the Critchley era. So, you know, an early goal and get the crowd going, I mean, you know, that might, might, might galvanise them. So, well, let's... Uh, Stay positive. So, uh, okay. Well, thanks for joining us, gents. Thank you, Paul. And um, if you like, please like, subscribe, etc. And feel free to leave comments. I know many of you like to do in the uh, YouTube section on this. So, um, take care. And we'll see you next week.